This video is about statistical significance by using Excel. When do you expect the difference to be significant and not the result of random fluctuations? Here is the famous bell curve that says if this is the value you expect and you find out that that is the value you observe, is that difference significant or not? In order to calculate that, we need on the horizontal axis standard error units. We want them to be unit free. We expected 33, that could be kilograms, nanograms, I don't care, centigrades, we could use Fahrenheit, Celsius, and we compare it with 35.3, but how can I compare them without not paying any attention to the units of measurement? The standard error does that for us. The standard error, also called relative standard deviation, is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of cases. So the larger your sample is, the smaller the standard error becomes. That means there is less and less chance that results vary by random fluctuations. In order to calculate that for smaller samples under 30, and that is usually what science deals with because of budgetary issues, we use the t-test. And we calculate for, let's say, for 35.3, the actual t-value, and then we find out what the critical t-value is. The critical t-value is usually within the yellow range, that is 95% of the observations, and what is outside that range is usually considered statistically significant different. Not, it cannot be attributed to random fluctuations. Let's test it on a very simple situation. Say we had seven measurements, and the so-called null hypothesis says what you observed is what you expected. Let's say we expected 31, we observed 35.3. Is that significantly different, yes or no? Before you can apply the t-test, I have to use the t-test because I have less than 30 cases, but even if you have more than 30 cases, the t-test is always safe, unless your figures are not normally distributed. So we have to find out are they skewed. A normal distribution is not skewed, but if it tails to the left, it is skewed negatively. If it tails to the right, it's skewed positively. So we calculate the skew number. I used the function skew for column A and that was 0.22. Is that significantly skewed? The rule is if it's more than two times the square root of 6 divided by the number of cases, then it is significantly skewed. So I put in here a if statement that says if d2 is greater than 2 times the square root of 6 divided by the count of column A, then it is significantly skewed, otherwise no. It's not skewed, so I can use the t-test. I calculate the mean of my observations, average column A, standard deviation, number of cases, count. Let's assume the level of probability is 5%, that means 95% is the, the random range. I have 95% confidence that it's random, that the null hypothesis is correct. Then we need to calculate the standard error. Remember the standard error is always in standard error units. So that is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of cases, the square root of 7, 1.6. What is the actual t-value? The actual t-value is how far am I away from what I expected in standard error units. So we divide the difference 
between observed and expected, we divide it by the standard error. So 2.71 units of standard error am I away from what I expected? What is the critical t-value? We call the function that is called t inverse two-tailed. 2.5% two to the left, 2.5% to, to the right. The degrees of freedom is always the number of cases minus 1. So the critical t-value is 2.45. So to show it here, this would be 2.45. And the actual t-value is actually 2.71. So it's way outside the range. So we declare this a significant difference. It cannot be attributed to random fluctuations. The null hypothesis, hypothesis is rejected. The measurements observed are significantly different from what I expected. You can also calculate, if you don't like these steps, you can also find the probability that this is a random result by using the function t dist two tailed. Again, that is the x value we found. And the degrees of freedom is the number of cases minus 1. That tells me that there is 3.5% that this is, can be attributed to random fluctuations, which is a very low percentage. And then if you want to make sure that you got the same result, then I calculate the inverse version of that 3.5% and I get exactly 2.71. Just to show you, if the expectation would have been 33, then the result would be random. Because the actual t-value is before or inside the critical t-value. Let's do that for a different situation. In this case, I had observations before a treatment and after a treatment. I calculate the differences between the two. Sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Uh, can I use my t-test? Yes, because they are all not randomly skewed. So the skew factor is each time square root of 6 divided by the skew factor. And in all cases, that was not greater than two times the standard error SES of the skew factor. So I calculate the mean of the differences, the average of C2 through C17, the standard deviation, the number of cases of differences, level of probability. The standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of cases. What is the actual t-value? You divide... The difference, 7.13, by standard error. Remember, t-values are standard error units. The critical t-value is t inverse two-tailed. So my verdict is significant. I could have skipped all these calculations by making immediately a t-test Function. The t-test function does all the work for you. It says what is array 1, what is array 2, how many tails do you want, two tailed or one tailed, and then finally it says is this a paired test? Yes, it is paired. So I have a type 1 and OK it. And if you would use t inverse on the t-test, you would exactly get the actual t-value that we calculated very extensively here. I just did this to explain a little better what the t-test actually does. Here we have a similar situation. This time I skipped all my in-between calculations and did immediately a t-test based on this array and that array, type 1, it is a pair test, and I decided on a two-tails test. However, 
sometimes you don't have paired situations. In this case, I have only six observations in the treated group and eight observations in the non-treated group. If you do this manually this way, it is very complicated because you have to pool your standard deviations and your actual t-value has to be calculated according to this formula. I would say forget it. Just go for the t-test. However, I have a little problem this time. The t-test tells me a ray column A, a ray column B, two tails, but now I have to make a decision on the type. Is it two samples with equal variance or two samples with unequal variance? I made a bet on equal variance. Is that correct? I don't know. We have to find out with the F-test. The F-test, F stands for variances. I have to find with the F-test what is the probability that the variance of column A versus the, the variance of column B is just random. And the F-test tells me that that probability of randomness is actually 61%. That is very high. If that would have been 5% or 4% or 3%, I would have to revise my t-test setting. And I would say, yeah, I, I have to use type 3 because there is an unequal variance. By the way, I did not do here my skew test, which you really should do in good research. Statistics are very difficult. I have quite some experience with it and very often I still get stuck. I forget something or I don't quite know what to do. So I think you need to know much more than what I just discussed. So I developed for you a CD-ROM and a book for scientists who use Excel. It tells you here that it has four parts, data analysis, plotting data, curve fitting and statistical analysis. Statistical analysis go much deeper into all these statistical issues and it goes into alternatives. When can you use which test? When can you not use that test? You can find all of this at genesispc.com.